Top Bird Talk. Nick Majerison here. This piece is taken from the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists annual conference last year. Don't forget, of course, the AA and A 2020 annual conference at the San Diego Convention Center still has tickets available. Don't forget to check out aaandacom forward slash meetings for more details. That's aaandacom forward slash meetings. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, hello, I'm Desiree Chappell, and this is Top Med Talk. We're coming to you live from the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists 2019 Annual Congress in Chicago, Illinois. ANA 2019 is a gathering of over 3,000 certified registered nurse anesthetists, or CRNAs, for the largest networking and educational event in nurse anesthesia. Now, this year, the ANA has partnered with Top Med Talk to bring the meeting to our listeners. With over the course of these three days, we're sitting down with presenters, ANA leadership, and delegates to discuss hot topics in the CRNA community and anesthesia practice in general. Now, I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Monty Mythen. Hello, Monty. How are you? I'm good. Great to be here. So, um, we've had the opportunity to sit down with some thought leaders within the ANA. ANA and um, CRNAs. And so we have the opportunity to sit down with Brett Kendon. He's a CRNA and the Assistant Program Director at Northern Kentucky University, um, Director of the Simulation um, Lab for Nurse Anesthesia, and he's also the Chair of the Simulation Subcommittee for the ANA. And we're going to be talking about simulation in education. So Brett, thank you so much for sitting down and joining us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's yeah. exciting. Brett, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your experience there at, at NKU. So NKU is a, a new program where just our third cohort is coming into their third year, uh, a new developed program. And uh, one of the exciting things about a new program is we can start it from scratch. So curriculum, all of those type of components. And we're very lucky. Northern Kentucky University just um, last year um, did the ribbon cutting for our $100 million simulation center. So it's a five-story building just dedicated to healthcare simulation. We have radiology with functional CT scanner. Um, We have a kinetics lab for the um, athletic training department, uh, respiratory therapy, four ICU beds. We have an operating room, uh, pipe gases, all of those type of things. So everything is functional in those environments. Very very awesome opportunity. Yeah. How many of those types of labs are around in our region? In... Well, it depends on which sort of setting you're in. Um, a lot of large university medical centers have those type of things. The VA is actually a, a leader in that. They've just um, built a huge center down in Florida um, mm-hmm. where they want to train all of their VA uh, personnel and, and sort of cycle them through those simulation opportunities. Um, university of Miami is another big one. They've got a huge, again, five-story um, hospital, essentially, simulation hospital. So it's mm-hmm. it's moving forward. People are understanding the importance and the relevance of that as an education, you know, modem. Yeah. Have you had your students in there kind of getting dirty now? And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, we certainly, we incorporate that thread of simulation throughout our program. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And what is the what is the reaction of the students when they go into this? Is it uh... well? It all depends what how sort of desensitized they are to it. So if they're we're a graduate program, so if in their undergraduate bachelor's program, if they've had exposure to it, it's not as mm. you know different. But those programs that haven't had a lot of it, obviously, there's a little bit of a learning curve and a, a sort of incorporation of that um, teaching delivery system as well. Mm. How frequently can people get through? Because one of the challenges about simulation is access to the Getting off work and access to the lab is it programmed into everyone's yes. Annual? So that's, okay. yes, so that's exactly part of our curriculum. It's it's built into their clinical courses, and we consider it a clinical day or a clinical experience. And once so you start work, it. what about the folks when you know look, chaps like myself getting older? Do we get access? Do we have an annual trip to the simulator? Or? It's no, we don't um, specifically have that opportunity, but more of, of our um, KYNA, which is our Kentucky State Association yep. meetings, we're embedding um, simulation opportunities into those. So workshops for neuroaxial anesthesia. We have a difficult airway um, simulation workshop that we're developing for next year. So definitely, it's it's moving forward. Oh, Absolutely. fantastic! I look forward to that. And so, and then the the uh, educators that you have. The groups that can use the sim lab to teach that you're just bringing in kind of like the the um, anesthesia. Um, oh, what am I trying to say? You know the the, clinicians. the teams and clinicians. Yeah. yeah so to teach. we have you know obviously our faculty. We have core faculty yeah. people that help us, but we obviously reach out to clinicians for experience and um, as content experts in different areas or specialties. So, mm-hmm. for example. 
before pediatric rotations, we bring them in for a, a day um, earlier before they rotate out to their pediatric specialty. And then we run through a whole simulation day of activities just to make sure they're up to speed thinking in pediatric, um, yeah. you know, the pediatric trainers, smaller airways, those type of things. And then that prepares them better. So when they hit that new environment, they're going to be much um, yeah. more, more ready and prepared to... Yeah. Yeah, engage in that so, environment. So early on in the days of simulation, I mean, simulation intuitively is the right thing to do. Uh, but early on in the days of simulation, people are all on about, well, show me the evidence. Uh, I, I think we're beyond that now, aren't we? Don't we accept the fact that it's it, it's very helpful and it's the right thing yeah, to do? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So early simulation, I mean, we think of Recess Annie, maybe yeah. doing some, you know, BLS <laughs> training type of thing, yeah. a sort of a low reality fidelity component. But now it's it's moved and transitioned forward so much. Um and it, just the the evidence that's supporting it is coming from different avenues in healthcare. So on one area is the medicine, the, you know, medical training um, and how they're sort of moving forward. There was a big study from the American Association of Medical Colleges 2011, and they did a, an across the board. They partnered with Simulation, Society for Simulation Healthcare, uh, National League of Nursing, and a, a whole bunch of other uh, patient safety organizations to sort of see what's the state of science in medical education across the board. And that really was sort of setting a stage of like, okay, where are we at at this point? Um, the next sort of large study that's come out was the National Council on State Board of Nursing. And that study was really interesting. That was nursing centric. But what they did is they uh, took a class from coming into a bachelor's program for three years and then a year out. And they did 10 centers. It was a multi-centered study around the country. It was a, it was a you know, huge study. And they actually took them through in different groups, three different groups. So the first group of nurses would be dedicated into a 10% simulation. The next was 25%. And then the third was 50%. So of the whole three years of their nursing training, they were in the simulation environment and lab for 50% of their clinical experiences. Oh, wow. And, the out, and then they followed them a year yeah. afterwards to yeah. see, okay, what was their HESI, you know, their final um, scores for graduating? Um, what was their clinical competencies up to a year out? And they found that the evidence was that up to 50% is just as effective um, in uh, attaining uh, competencies and, and skill level. Yeah, that's the, that's really the largest study out there and mm. really one that's referencing and, and changing because boards of nursing are now changing the percentages that colleges and training programs are allowed to uh, incorporate into that clinical training. Now, now, with the growth of high fidelity simulation, the sort of large units you're referring to becoming pretty mainstream, I think all of us have got some high fidelity simulation center access of various different scales. There's been a growth in low fidelity simulation as well. Do you, do you embrace both, i.e. The, the, you know, nearer the patient, let's just remind you, top up on a skill type of thing? Mm. It, I think it all depends on what we're looking at of the objectives mm. and what is the um, skill level of the practitioner at that time. So if we're doing uh, something, for example, like a basic airway management and training, yes. we don't need a, a very high-end $80,000 plus trainer for that experience <laughs> yeah. when we're really looking at dexterity and yes. movement mm. and just a, sort of a basic skill. So a, a basic airway trainer yes. is absolutely appropriate for a deliberate practice in order to be able to you know start that skill for development. We move into a higher fidelity component, maybe when we're doing a, a crisis management or intubating under duress, and then we incorporate a whole bunch of contextual influences as to how can that skill now be evaluated with all the other mm. distraction per se, but w within a different context. Um, and then we get into critical thinking, problem solving. And then there's a te the teamwork aspect of it, which you right. really need the higher fidelity simulation environment to test teams. Right, don't. exactly. So we have, you know, essentially on a level one per se would be a basic skills training, level two, uh, moving forward into how that could be incorporated into a situation. And then maybe level three, how would I be able to lead a group of people, like you say, in a, a sort of a um, interprofessional educational perspective of how can we bring all of those components together? Yeah. So um, where are you, um, where do you think the, the sim lab is uh, kind of moving? You said you, we've, um, that's been used on a greater scale. Uh, where do you think it's kind of going now um, with use in, in education? I mean, is it something that you, you just said that the study looked at, um, you know, greater than 50% utilization in, in education was actually useful? I mean, do you see that just, you know, 
um, adding to what we're already currently? So I, I see it as sort of two areas, really. One of them, the first is for a training as a training adjunct and how that can be incorporated or embedded into curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, really, the, the best way to do it or think about it is on Monday morning, they have a didactic lecture or presentation on a certain topic. Tuesday, they get to practice it in the lab. They get to you know, get some hands-on experience in a simulated environment. And then they put that and translate that into a practice situation where they go to clinical on Friday. Mm-hmm. If we think of it as a really basic perspective, that's, that's how it fits into the development. Mm-hmm. We learn about it, we practice with it, and now we apply it. When we're talking on the the next level or the different level is the competency evaluation and how you would assess a skill, not the formative or developmental part, um, but the actual summative or evaluation component. That's really where things are moving forward. And the the medical community, again, is an early adopter and embracer of that. So if we think about specific um, graduate competencies, The dentistry, chiropractic, pharmacology, radiology, cardiology have all got OSCEs or objective structured clinical exams Mm -hmm. as part of their final Mm -hmm. uh, demonstration to be able to come board certified. What's most interesting is the um, American Board of Anesthesiology has now incorporated that third component. So somebody to become board certified as an anesthesiologist has to do the written paperwork an oral board component, and now they have to do an in-lab competency evaluation Mm -hmm. to demonstrate competency to be able to come board certified. Interesting. So if we're thinking that it's not just the training and development as some Mm -hmm. terminal high-stakes testing components, um, which is, you know, again, another incorporation of the simulation components. So is that something that you guys are looking at within the the NKU program? I mean, are you... We we do that. We do it sequentially. (laughs) Um, not necessarily as a, as a terminal, final. yeah, mm-hmm. final type of thing, but certainly they have demonstrable skills that they have to um, do progressively through the program. Mm-hmm. So they would maybe practice something like neuroaxial anesthesia, mm-hmm. uh, um, spinal epidural type of dexterity, things like that, and then they actually have a test out of that skill set. Can they do that? Can they demonstrate it safely and effectively? And we have certain um, milestones throughout the program where those things, uh, those components are actually built in. They should be able to do those. Yeah. That's interesting. So um, tell me about the, the, the AANA subcommittee um, for simulation and education and your, your role in that and where that's going. So the simulation subcommittee came really from a genesis from a, a, a simulation interest group of uh, clinicians and, and practitioners mm-hmm. that um, we were having meetings at um, meetings like this, for example, and the assembly of school faculty. And just having people together thinking about, hey, what can we do to move simulation, integration, and cooperation in, in anesthesia education? And so we developed some of the um, components that we thought were interesting or important to uh, identify within practitioners uh, uh, across the board. So we actually came up with a, a nurse anesthesia simulation um, a survey, educator survey, and we put that out about two years ago and garnered a lot of information where educators were at, um, their level of experience, their level of um, incorporation of simulation, and all of these sort of components that we were looking at. And what we did is we compiled that information, and then we presented that to the ANA Education Committee um, as a potential um, necessity or um, identifying the need for a simulation subcommittee to sort of address some of these concerns that are a little bit different um, yeah, and affecting yeah. exactly the 120 plus programs we have in the country. So yeah. that's where it sort of came about. And the ANA thankfully embraced that and uh, allowed us to proceed. So we're into our second year now wow. at the moment. So are you going to be working on like developing curriculum and, and guidelines for what the, the simulation education looks like? That. The, we really have sort of four main areas of focus in the subcommittee. So the first one is the nurse anesthesia program simulation-based education and how we can sort of um, assist the educators within programs specifically. So some of those components that we look at is incorporating simulation in curricula, those OSCE or formative and summative evaluation procedures, identification of benchmarks, um, and program resources that they have access to, and maybe a regional sharing perspective of, okay, maybe can we boot camp together at a certain place to go through these skills? So a part of that actually came out of the survey that a lot of people identified that those were the areas that they were deficient or that they would like some support on. 
So what our subcommittee doing is putting in recommendations to the education committee for delivery of content at meetings. Gotcha. So at the um, assembly school faculty or now the ADCE didactic clinical educators, um, this earlier this year, we actually did a full sort of a, a very focused simulation perspective, teaching about theory, how you can incorporate these modalities. Those type of things were sort of embedded. Now what we're doing is sort of fine-tuning that a little bit. We actually just had a meeting a couple of days ago on what we would do for 2020. Mm. Again, addressing what educators want to know, how we can help and assist, the sort of workshops, those type of things that we can do. The second area is faculty support and development. And um, again, that sort of tags on to that a little bit. But what are the workshops? What specifically do they want to look at? How can we develop networks? And what are educator-centric uh, components that they need. And then moving into practice and professional standards, which is an area where sort of designing guidelines for nurse anesthesia simulation. There's a couple of large organizations, the Society of Simulation Healthcare and Anaxel, that already have preset standards for types of simulation within healthcare generally and broadly. But what we would like to do is maybe have some ideas um, specifically related to what we do in nurse anesthesia practice and delivery and education. Another area that we've sort of been thinking about is how can we get um, maybe some milestone developments. We've got a new um, uh, uh, clinical evaluation tool um, that is just starting to roll out. And how would maybe some simulation or um, evaluation methods and tools be utilized to support that? And uh, what type of innovative CEU or CPC components, instead of maybe online modules, That's what I was ask. could we have something <laughs> regional where, or you know, that we could develop in order to encourage that? So. Um, that's just a couple of areas. And then we also want to focus on simulation scholarship, um, different types of tools. One thing that we're working on at the moment is a, a valid and reliable tool, an OSCE, essentially a clinical exam for machine checkout. Mm. Right now, all the programs in the country are doing different things on how they would check machine checkout and check off someone. Well, let's have a consensus and put that that everyone can utilize that. So moving forward, we want to identify what type of components in your axial anesthesia, for example, and what would be a check off a valid and reliable tool that people can utilize in the simulation environment. There's a lot wow. of work going on for yeah. a lot of people that maybe we can consolidate and collaborate on. The other thing is... Um, is there an opportunity maybe for simulation-focused uh, doctoral project, projects within programs that yeah. we could, you know, if we're going to be doing one at one center, well, let's talk and maybe we can expand that to the numbers and, and different environments where we're sort of practicing or utilizing that. Uh, one of my projects that we have going on at the moment is ultrasound evaluation of gastric content um, for aspiration risk mm -hmm. um, using a simulation-based education modality pre-post-test um, for proficiency you know, yeah. comfort level, those type of things. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that we can sort of talk about, collaborate on, and progress in the scholarship arena. And then one of the main things that we're doing at the moment is the survey that we had done informally from the special interest group, we're actually formalizing that into a large survey through all programs to evaluate, again, what resources faculty have, what utilization of simulation in their programs, deficits and barriers that may be needing to overcome financial restrictions, and then develop a white paper based on all of that information. So we get a state of science within nurse anesthesia, education, programs, educators, and where are we at at the moment? Are we consistent with what is developing and, and happening in healthcare? Or here are some recommendations that maybe can move us forward. So that's really the, the big task that we're working on at the moment is getting that white paper developed and that we're based on that survey. Wow. Lots of valuable that's information. A lot of work. That yeah. is a lot of work. My gosh, you guys yeah. are busy. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what good. We do. Those are great initiatives. I mean, it yeah. sounds like, I mean, this simulation is a, it can be and sounds like it will be a, a large component of education for um, our upcoming CRNAs. And, and hopefully, as Monty said, you know, one of the questions I had is, as a provider that's been out for a while, being able to get into that sim lab, you know, that if I haven't done, you know, I mean, I haven't done OB in years, but it's something I would like to kind of, you know, start doing again. Do we have the opportunity to kind of get in the sim lab to do something like that? Or even just a regional workshop. Yeah. You know, like the difficult airway you know, initiative yeah. that we're thinking about doing for members of the KYNA, not yeah. necessarily just centric to programs, but uh, clinicians in general, yeah. what, what would they like? And here's just a different way or modality to, to learn that skill and task. So, yeah. 
No, I think it sounds great. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> a, I'm, it's A&A. not just myself. There's right. a there's a whole a, team of a it, group sure. in the the simulation subcommittee, and then in the expanded interest group. Yeah. Um, educators from all over the country and all programs are very interested in supporting and moving this sort of initiative forward um, and getting some consensus within our profession. Where, where do you think simulation's going next? I mean. Um, Let's take virtual reality, for example. Am I going to be able to put my VR goggles at home and come to your sim center? So that's, there's a lot of movement towards that. Yeah. If we look at the um, – there's a paper that gets put out every year to the 100 most cited articles in uh, healthcare simulation education. And virtual reality and past ta- task trainers specifically related to virtual or embedded reality was about 14% of all the papers written uh, on healthcare simulation. So there's definitely a movement towards that. My personal feeling on that is if we're going to be utilizing a a technology, what is the benefit and how is it going to develop the skill? If we're using an example for um, uh, ACLS, uh, there's some virtual reality you know, programs out there, goggles, things like that, that you can do ACLS processing. That's great. If that is specific and the objectives have been met, then that's great. Um, but I don't necessarily see a high utilization of that technology yet. One that we do have embraced is uh, virtual reality bronchoscope. Mm-hmm. It's called ORSIM, and it's a, spe- a specific uh, virtual reality um, bronchoscope that our students train on. And you can pick different anatomy, um, pharyngeal abscesses, get different types of things, but okay. it definitely works on dexterity and movement. And that translation into the OR is extremely significant. Oh, I've yeah, had students sure. that have practiced on that, haven't had a real double lumen tube or, you know, used a, a bronchoscope before go in for first time. And actually the, the surgeons in the room have said, where did you? That was an amazing demonstration for the first time. Yeah. Relate that back to okay, because we've practiced under that virtual reality mod- modality. But um, again, I, I see specific pockets, not just that's the way everything's heading. In so, general. what else would you pick off the list from your perspective of the hundred most cited articles? Is there what do you think is going to be Being coming our way soon? Yeah. The one of the one of the changes was moving from mannequins into a standardized patient situation. Okay. So the mannequins that we have, obviously they can vomit, they can seize, they can do all of these sort of fancy things, but the interaction isn't necessarily there. Hmm. So there's a movement towards standardized patient, which is a person playing a role, uh-huh. like an actor per se. Yeah. But having some components of simulation built into that interaction. So obviously we have communication but we can move that forward with different devices. So one of them is uh, our wearables. Mm. So they can actually have a T-shirt or a, a shirt overlay that's actually embedded with um, different magnets is one of the examples. And when they put a stethoscope onto that patient, that magnet triggers a certain sound. So heart sounds and um, lung sounds can actually be changed based on that. Or they can wear a, a device on their abdomen that when they're being ultrasounded, um, they gotcha. can get th- different oh, types of anatomy. Wow. So it's a human being in the bed, and when you put the stethoscope on, you're listening to mitral valve prolapse one minute, exactly. you're listening to aortic stenosis the next. That's exactly yeah. right. Brilliant. So oh, that is really the, cool. There's one that's the wearable, yep. and then there's another one that I really like. It's actually a, a Bluetooth stethoscope. So mm. from my iPad, I can actually, they just put it onto the patient, <laughs> and I can just dictate what is being presented through that stethoscope in real time. Um, it's a little less hassle per se yeah. then and you know how many t-shirts do we need of different sizes sort of thing so <laughs> but with um, ultrasound for example you'll get the oh that you're pressing a bit hard there doctor and that jelly was a bit cold sort yeah of, yeah yeah it's a, a, a bit more of interactive feedback mm. and and certainly they can do wearables for um, peripheral iv placement mm. um different type of arterial line mm. overlays things like that so i see a, a, a movement there where we have a an interactive not just a static sort of trainer situation yeah well, fantastic. Well, Brett, thank you so much for sitting down with us and chatting about this. I think it's fascinating and, and something really to look forward to. Is there to. anything we didn't cover off? Yeah. Right, your, no, no. no. Brilliant. Good. Yeah. Well yeah, done. We've covered. Want to come and see your center? I know. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I'm coming up. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe for the meeting uh, to be able to make yeah. um, one of the, the, the breakout session yeah. or workshops over there. Well, just if you're good. in the area and moving through, yeah. um, just you feel free to email me and just say, yeah. hey, can I stop by and just have a look and see what's around? 
Yeah, that would know, be show name. that would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, again, thank you for sharing this knowledge and, and the information about the subcommittee. Um, if people want to get a hold of you or anyone else on the subcommittee because they're interested in um, this facet of anesthesia, what's the best way to do that? So, one of the things that we've actually uh, developed in cooperation with the ANA was the ANA Connect simulation site. So, we oh. actually have a specific simulation focused site on ANA Connect. Okay. For sharing, collaboration, uh, people are just putting ideas before we go to meetings or we we post what we've been discussing at the meetings as a sort of an outreach. Uh-huh. So that's a really good method to uh, for people they can chat independently or within the group. Uh, and again, information or um, sharing of different components like uh, OSCEs or checklists, things like that. Yeah. Uh, or they can feel free to email me at kendonb one at nku.edu. And we'll, we can put that on the, in the show notes yeah. too. So that'll be great. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, there are a lot of people that listen that aren't in the anesthesia community may not be on AA connect, but may have, you know, nursing committee communities or medical that would, you know, like to get involved and, and work together. So Absolutely. that's great. Well, again, thank you for the, the hard work that you're doing. <laughs> it's much needed and, um, congrats on the NKU program. Thank and you. And it sounds like it's going gangbusters. And this is great. Yeah. And where are we going to be watching the rugby world cup final? Are you going? Or? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I was uh, lucky enough a couple of years ago when I was in New Zealand, my uh, six-month pregnant wife allowed me to go to oh the national, uh, yeah, the uh, World Cup rugby and in New Zealand. So I think I've that's my that's my one chip. time <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, um, Brett, we look forward to hopefully talking to you again on Top Med Talk. Um, thanks to all of our listeners. If you've been listening during a. AA- at A 2019. You can hear other podcasts that we've done. You can go on topmedtalk.com and find it there. Or we're, of course, on the Twittersphere, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, we even have some pics on Instagram, I believe, that are, have been up there for a little while. So check that out. Maybe one and, from uh, Lou Malinot- Malinotti. Maybe tonight. they're going to yeah, they're gonna criticize your <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> and uh, again, like I said, check us out excuse me, on topmedtalk.com. So thanks for listening. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.